gives me the opportunity to do a soft launch of the next Chapo Trap House miniseries. That's right. You are listening to episode zero of the new and official upcoming Movie Mindset Podcast. And best of all, I can introduce you, although you probably already know her, to my co-host for this project, the wonderful Hessa Denny. Hessa, welcome. Hello, Will. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me for this lovely excursion into the world of the cinema. We've got much to discuss this year in the Oscars, but I would just like to uh, give some context here to the listener. Um, you might remember uh, a month or two back, uh, we made fun on the show of uh, the New York Times critics, uh, A.O. Scott and Manola Dargis's, uh, their picks for the top movies of the year. Um, in one of their lists, there was a movie called Expedition Content <laughs> that was described as staring at 40 minutes of a blank screen and listening to noises. <laughs> We made fun of that uh, that what seemingly ridiculous movie that is like the kind <laughs> the kind of something that uh, the kind of movie that only a film critic would put on their best of the year list. Uh, I made fun of it, thought nothing of it, until Hessa listened to the episode and immediately texted me saying, "Will, I saw Expedition Content in theaters, and all forty <laughs> minutes of the blank blank screen I was staring at was a stunning cinematic achievement." And I thought to myself, <laughs> "This is exactly the kind of sicko." The kind of movie poisoned sicko <laughs> that I need to anchor this upcoming project with me. I, I'm beyond saving. I'm beyond salvation. <laughs> I was loving it. <laughs> well, it was a, it was a great movie. I liked it a lot. It was, you know, because it's about Michael Rockefeller, who's the guy. All the like Harvard researchers went to that like uncontacted tribe in like the '60s to like document them. And Michael Rockefeller of those Rockefellers was like, yeah, I'll go down there and record some audio. And then he got killed and presumably eaten by one of the tribes. But <laughs> and, <laughs> he and has like, that is some of the audio you hear. No, no, no. I oh, wish. <laughs> <laughs> Can you pass the salt? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> no, but it is it is cool because it's, you know, it's a bunch of audio and like. Um, they translate like what the natives are saying and they're like, look at this like arrogant white guy coming in here again with his gun. And he's talking about like the shotgun microphone and like <laughs> it's, um, I don't know if it would be good not in a theater. The theater was like the surround sound kind of aspect of it was, but I liked it a lot. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> unfortunately, and when I heard you making fun of it, I was like, Yeah. <laughs> That is pretty well, much what it is, though. You you proved your bona fides to me as uh, the only person I know who knows more about movies than I do. <laughs> so, uh, so let's talk about some movies people actually have seen and been nominated. Yeah. So I, I've prepared sort of a, a, a preamble for, for for this year's Oscars, and I'd, I'd like to take you and the listener through it now. And then uh, Hessa and I will be getting into each of the movies of the year. We will give you. Our, our predictions, if you'd like to make a wager on this year's Oscars, and we will also uh, be providing what we think should win, or if we were Oscar voters, what we would be voting for, and then maybe also discuss some movies that didn't make the cut this year for the Oscars, but that are still worth talking about. So without further ado, our preview of the upcoming 95th Academy Awards. So the Oscars are the Super Bowl of movies. And they give us opportunity to take stock of the year in film and consider what the dream factory is pulling from our collective unconscious and to try and divine in the entrails of the movies and celebs elevated to Oscar status just what it is that is on our minds and where we might be going. This process is known as movie mindset. Let's begin with the overwhelming favorite, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. A movie that asks... In an infinite constellation of possible universes, might there be one in which your family likes each other? Or does it not matter how many competing realities there are because it's okay to not be okay in all of them? Likewise, in The Fablemans, we also get a look at the family. One of our all-time great American directors pulls back the curtain on his own life and creative journey to reveal that perhaps a lifelong love of cinema is ultimately a futile attempt to deal with and control the realization that your parents have sex and that you are doomed to follow them. Family trauma is bad enough, 
But the Banshees of Inisherin is about how getting rid of someone who isn't related to you is even harder than just showing up for Christmas or Thanksgiving once a year. Doubly so if you're Irish. Not sure what this means, but it's one of three big movies this year in which something bad happens to a donkey. Perhaps a bad omen for the Democratic Party. Moving on from the cold wars of relationships to the hot ones of the past, we have All Quiet on the Western Front, which is about a war that happened in the 20th century that was hell, but here's the twist. It's okay to feel bad for the German people who died in it. While World War I may be ancient history, Top Gun Maverick shows us just how cool all the next-gen wars we're going to be fighting are. No need to feel bad for any of the swag alpha males involves, because war and the people who kill in them are dope as fuck. While war is a fiery crucible in which countless lives are wasted, but fame is an even deeper furnace into which millions of lives are shoveled. But unlike war, this is all for a very important purpose that's ultimately worth it, entertaining us. In both Tar and Elvis, we're asked to consider the people behind such cultural touchstones as Jailhouse Rock, Blue Suede Shoes, Unchained Melody, and the theme from Monster Hunter Rise. <laughs> Indeed, it's important that Hollywood remind us, the rube public, that we wouldn't have great culture without those far-seeing individuals who, through alchemy, transmute the base materials of hillbilly rough trade into the gold of stardom. Now, Avatar The Way of Water is on the surface also a movie about war and the grim, brutal process of imperial resource extraction, which continues to shape all human endeavors. But actually, it is a movie about something much worse than that. Vacations. Indeed, Avatar and Triangle of Sadness both offer us glimpses of fantastic and beautiful cruises we would all love to go on. But should we? No, we shouldn't. Vacations are evil. There is not one shred of enjoyment and luxury that you should feel good about, you fat fucking five-fingered sky demons. Stay at home and watch movies instead. And finally, movies can also allow us to explore subjects that are too disturbing and upsetting to consider in our day-to-day -day lives. I'm referring to women talking. I don't know what this movie is about. I'm just referring to the title, which was so frightening to me that I've done no further investigation. Hessa, why don't we begin with Best Picture nominee, Women Talking, a film that you, I have not seen, but that you watched last night. So please, tell me, okay. what are these women talking about? These women are, it's basically like they're having a, a woman's studies course. If like, they're all Mennonite like wives in this compound. And first of all, the movie is gray. It's like one inch away from black and white, but not quite black and white, which is really annoying. But it's an argument between um, a battered wife, um, a first wave feminist, a second wave feminist, and a third wave feminist who are all Mennonites. And um, <laughs> the, the conclusion they come to, I actually wasn't able to finish it because I had to leave because I was late for something. But um, I... Uh, a, a, glow, a glowing review of this movie so far. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> But I, I'm, sure it's, I'm sure it's excellent. It's like 12 angry women, kind of. But... I think it's I think it's taking best picture this year. Okay, wow. <laughs> this is this 5 is or 10 minutes in. I was like this is a this is going to clinch it. It's either this or fable mims, I think. Well, I mean like when we when we get into like making predictions, I think at the Academy Awards, at least of recent vintage, you have to take into account uh wokeism and w what what movies that they will um seek to uh uh, seek to reward based on what apology they're seeking to make for be past behavior. So with women yes. talking, it could be, you know, all the obvious bad shit Hollywood's done to women. But I, gu I guess with women talking, it, the point of this movie is it is it that being a trad wife is not all that it's cracked up to be? Uh, from what I could gather, yeah. It's because basically it's an interesting story and there's like good performances, but it it is kind of... It wasn't really my cup of tea. <laughs> it's just <laughs> I can talk to a mirror, and that's women talking for me. You know, I don't need to watch these these women arguing. But that's why I'm a bad um, a bad person. And I think that this is the apology movie. I think some people think it's going to be everything, everywhere, all at once because of the um, like largely Asian cast. I do think that's going to get a bunch of acting awards, but I don't think it's going to take Best Picture because. All the anecdotes of people being like, 
I tried showing, this is like the best movie I've ever seen. I tried showing it to my parents and they <laughs> fell asleep five minutes in. And oh, that it, one guy, yeah, was yeah. like, <laughs> who was gutted that his dad was just like <laughs> checked out uh, dur- during this movie that meant so much to him. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I suppose like, uh, uh, so, so, so by your pred- predictive abilities, Hollywood's need to apologize to women for all of their mistreatment in the past is greater than their need to apologize to Asians for roughly a century of portraying them as like um, gong hitting sexless buffoons or demure uh, geisha types. Yeah, I also I think women talking has much more of an academy sheen on it, you know, and I think everything everywhere all at once, which a lot of people are really polarized by. I think it was like a solid three star movie. (laughs) You know, I think it was really good, but um, I think that it doesn't have the sheen. It's like too goofy. There's too much silly stuff going on. And I think the Oscars, as, you know, ridiculous as they are and as fraudulent and Mickey Mouse as they are, they still see themselves as like a serious institution in a lot of ways. So I think it can't really go to a silly goose movie. I don't see it happening. Well, like in, in talking about um, the, the best picture nominees and, and who might win and like just generally what, what this all means to be like a best picture winner. I just like for frame of reference to discuss the last like since 2013, the last like run of best picture winners. And I'm just going to go through these and I, I'd like to just like uh, for you Hesse, and the listener to just sort of think to yourself, do I still think about any of these movies do these movies still like retain a cultural purchase of like the best picture of that year? And I'm beginning with 2013's Argo, followed by <laughs> 2014's 12 Years a Slave, 2015's Birdman, 2016's Spotlight, 2017's Moonlight, 2018's The Shape of Water. Ooh, oh boy. <laughs> oh my then God. 2019's Green Book, then Jesus. Parasite, and then Nomad Land. And then, God, last year's Best Picture winner, Coda. Coda! A, a fucking <laughs> yeah, TV awesome. movie seen by, like, 20 people. That, I mean, like, that's... I, I think Coda might be the worst one of those. I mean, I haven't even seen this movie, but... I I swear to God, Coda was, like, a book-fixing scheme, like, engineered by Vegas or something. <laughs> <laughs> someone put, like... Someone put, Stop like... the steal. Yeah, someone put $500 on Coda winning it all and made, like, 50 mil. <laughs> yeah, now they own Twitter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think of those, though, I think, like, Moonlight is, like, definitely still, like, one of the best movies of the decade. Top three for me, at least. Um, But the other ones, like... (laughs) Yeah, ew. (laughs) I mean, I I, I thought Parasite was good, but it's a movie that I think has, like, suffered from, um, like over adulation in a way like yeah uh, you know absolutely. I, I, I think and i think people like um mistook it i think the, i think it was sort of like uh suffered from a little bit of inflation from like uh the good politics brigade who looked at this movie as like it's about class warfare and praxis and like i i just i i don't think i think it suffers from uh sort of um uh, movie inflation a little bit but i do think um uh bong joon ho is a great director but oh yeah um, he's he's the goat he's he's awesome um, but back, back to back to women talking. This is by uh, Sarah Polly. Uh, how's have, have you seen any of her other films? I mean, like I'm I'm a fan of her as an actress a great deal. You know, Go, uh, Zack Snyder's uh, Dawn, Dawn of, of the Dead, Dead remake. Yeah. yeah, I I didn't even know she was a director until this movie. But you know, there's like a bunch of really good performances in it, and I think like I don't know. I don't want to be too mean because it's really hard to make a movie, but. You know, there's that anecdote that she said where she was whenever she went through the TSA or customs for something for the movie, she would be like, yeah, I made this movie women talking and the the TSA people would be like, oh, I got enough of that at home with the wife. (laughs) And she was like, (laughs) and she was like um, yelling at them for it. What did she say? She was like. She was like, well, I mean, this is a movie about like Mennonite women being uh, raped and abused and their incredibly insular, uh, you know, insular, like sort of shut off communities with no recourse for the rest of the world. I mean, it's sort of about how they have to choose between like, uh, 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 do we hold accountable these men who have uh, horribly wronged us or do we like sever ourselves from the religion and community that orders our lives? Yeah. 
we got uh, we got uh, Jesse Buckley, who's sort of like a cool indie actress of the moment. She was in that movie Men this year that I didn't see. Mm-hmm. We got Francis Francis oh McDormand, who's who's always great. Although I will use this opportunity now to slag off Nomadland, another uh, I, I oh, thought yeah. very undeserving uh, Best Picture winner, a movie Total that like stinker. Yeah, just uh, a movie, a movie. I, I mean, I, I hate I hate to grade movies like this, but a movie that has, I mean, like what, what little. <laughs> Uh, what little uh, affection I could find for myself in that movie, based on Francis McDormand's like great performance in it, has been uh, utterly obliterated by the uh, absolute nitwit, no talent hack director Chloe Zhao's uh, foray into the Marvel universe <laughs> with uh, the Eternals, one of the worst movies I've ever seen. <laughs> that and it's movie... just like to see to see to see this one trick pony. Uh, uh, splay her magic hour fucking twilight uh, landscape uh, one, you know one note uh, movie movie move um, to go from Nomadland to doing the exact same thing in the shittiest Marvel movie ever made really uh, puts the lie to um, the, the promise of the, the talent uh, that people praised uh, Nomadland for I, but, uh, my favorite part in Eternals was when um, the one character who is, whose job it is to like make technology and give it to people is like in like Mesopotamia and he's like I'm going to give them a steam engine I think and they're like no it's too early they they won't they'll just destroy and he's like okay fine I'll give them the plow and it's like wait what were they going to do with a steam engine if they didn't even have agriculture yet what what did you think they were going to use it for well like they don't I mean, even have to, wheels what are you going to to create the a bomb uh, <laughs> yeah. several millennia later <laughs> When it cuts to him standing Druig, in the rubble. Druig was right, Hessa. We should never, they should have never given Sprite. these humans the plow. There's a it's, character named Sprite. It's so funny. <laughs> no, but I, yeah, I, I thought Nomad Led was a bit of like, uh, sort of like uh, the Hollywood like poverty tourism that, that left a bad taste in my mouth. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, moving on from uh, Women Talking, a movie I haven't seen, to the only other Best Picture nominee I haven't seen, All Quiet on the Western Front. I haven't seen this one either. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, like, I'm, I'll probably eventually end up watching this movie, but I sort of feel like I know what it is. I'm yeah. not sure it's, it's good enough, but <laughs> all I need to know about all, all... Basically, all I can think about when I try to consider All Quiet on the Western Front is uh, God Lex G's tweet that he hates war movies because they all have boring haircuts for all the men. <laughs> and that's reordered the way I think about not just war movies, but all movies in general. And it, it is true. War movies are nothing but boring haircuts top yeah. to bottom. <laughs> it's so true. Can I just ask you guys really quickly, have you been inundated over the last month with wall to wall ads for your consideration ads for all quiet on the Western front on all social media platforms? Oh yeah, Absolutely. I Absolutely. don't know what it, I can't do anything about it. I'm not in the academy. I don't know why I'm getting these ads. All I get on Twitter are all quiet on the Western Front. Vote in the academy and then gold ads like buy gold. <laughs> Two things I can't do anything with. It's like, buddy, uh, I would vote for you if I could, but <laughs> seems like they really want it. Yeah, I mean, uh, no disrespect to all quiet on the Western Front, but I don't think Hollywood is going to award Oscar gold to this movie because. They didn't blow up the Nord Stream pipeline. If Hollywood was responsible to that, they, 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 may, they may apologize by giving Germany a Best Picture movie, but I don't yeah. think that's happening this time. <laughs> All right, wh- wh- why don't we move on from uh, Women Talking, who has has already, already staked out a bold dark horse prediction for that will, that will win Best Picture. So if you're looking to like make a small bet that could pay off huge... Uh, th- this is currently at the lowest odds for win- for winning uh, Best Picture. So, like, why don't we talk about the the odds on favorite that all the Vegas bookmakers are picking? And Hesse, you mentioned it, everything, everywhere, all at once. Now, like you, I feel like to say that I thought that this movie was fine is yeah. inviting the scorn of the masses here because I, I I like like sim- similar to the movie writers who were uh, aghast to find that their their parents fell asleep watching this movie. I feel like they're, they're like there. There's so much um, cultural baggage and like sort of expectation caught up in this movie about whether you like or don't like it, uh, who it's for, who it's not for. I thought it was a fine movie, but certainly not uh, my favorite of the year. I'm certainly rooting for Michelle Yeoh and Daniel Hay Kwan. Uh, I, I I really liked both of them, but I got to say the second hour of this movie kind of dragged for me, and I found it a bit. 
a bit precious and like the be- the, the best summary of uh, my problem with everything everywhere all at once comes from uh, Chris Person who I just who described it as it's just Rick and Morty and Rick and Morty <laughs> is good but like Rick and Morty doesn't need to be like the entire culture and that's sort of how do I feel about like these multiverse movies yeah like I I was like really really on board until they started talking about theta verses and like you know um all this like marvel movie type bullshit i was like all right you're losing me a little here but i did cry at the end i was like this is a really you know it's a good emotional and i did get like a little choked up when michelle yo first does kung fu for the first time i was like let's go because you know it's michelle yo and i was like yeah and like you know to see her get a best actress nomination is wonderful because like i mean she is just such a great movie star and to, to have people rediscover her her old films and like yeah just to, just to see how like not, not just like uh, gifted she is an actress but how physically talented she is as a as a as a stunt performer and a martial artist is really incredible oh and yeah she's, she's in her still si- got it she's in her 60s she was killing it she was flying all over the place she was kicking people i was loving it i was like let's go i i really like the uh the first uh fight scene in every everything everywhere all at once with uh daniel Haquan and the uh, fanny pack i thought that was really cool and well oh, choreographed. Yeah. But then, as the movie wore on, I thought I thought the fights got a little too like a little too ridiculous. There was a little too many bells and whistles for me, and yeah, it sort the of, dildo it, it, it one lo- it, it lost me at points. Yeah, yeah, the dildo fight where she's fighting two guys with like dildos in their asses, and the fact that um, one of the directors, one of the Daniels, uh, that was his cameo moment was Michelle Yeoh hitting him with a dildo or like fighting him with a dildo. I thought that was a little bit. I thought it was showing your hand a little too much, a little bit too much <laughs> about like, you know, it was sort of like the equivalent of the scene in From Dust Till Dawn where uh, Tarantino just happened to happened to write a scene for Salma Hayek <laughs> for a shot of tequila into his mouth from from her feet. Like, yeah. like, like toes in mouth, tequila down throat. Yeah, I, I do think that Jamie Lee Curtis was like perfect casting for that villain role, too, though. I do like her slack jawed like acting like i don't know she just got the look perfectly with that like ridiculous haircut the and like uh diane would... from twin Peaks season three haircut <laughs> like <laughs> i would certainly love to see jamie lee curtis win an oscar because as someone who's had like one of the best careers in hollywood uh for an actress that you could possibly you could possibly dream of someone who has defined genre after genre but like never really been in like an oscar movie or never really i i could see her winning a uh, best supporting actress as sort of like a career summation and, and could uh, you imagine how because it's her and stephanie sue got um nominated both for everything everywhere all at once i could see like there being an uproar if she wins over stephanie sue because you know i feel like or angela bassett keep in mind oh my god well. yeah Wait, what is Angela Bassett nominated for? A Black Panther Wakanda Forever? Oh my god. <laughs> I forgot about that movie. I'm so glad that the Marvel movies seem to be dying, if if I'm not mistaken. Like how uh, from your didn't... lips to God's ears. Yeah. <laughs> Quantumania, like bomb. Isn't it doing horribly? <laughs> well, for a Marvel movie, it's it's done it's done about as bad as one of these movies can so far. Whether whether the fever will have broken remains to be seen. Mm-hmm. But I have like, look, if you like every, if you liked everything everywhere all at once, like, uh, no, no, no smoke here. I thought it was a good movie. Just, uh, I, I it was a little too precious for me. I, I didn't quite, uh, I, like I said, it, it, it wore thin on me in the second, in the second act of the movie. But that being said, I do have a rooting interest in, uh, if it indeed, uh, goes according to plan and it does clean up at this Academy Awards, I have a rooting interest in seeing it win. Because I would like to, I would like it to induce a some sort of uh, further psychic break in uh, Hollywood elsewhere. Jeff Wells, <laughs> I would like to see him detonate a suicide vest <laughs> to, in protest of this millennial movie, uh, take, taking credit from uh, other films that uh, he doesn't hate so dearly. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, but like God willing, <laughs> inshallah. All right. Uh, everything. Moving on from everything, everywhere, all at once. Uh, this is the the other movie that I think is sort of a dark horse to win. It's The Fablements. It's Spielberg back again. Spielberg gets nominated a lot, but his movies don't actually win that often. Case in point, 
when when fucking uh, a Shakespeare in Love beat out <laughs> beat Saving, Saving Private, Private Ryan, Ryan. <laughs> a movie that was like I like I thought that was be like that you're like that was like as mortal locked as you could get for a, for a, a movie to win Best Picture <laughs> Steven Spielberg's tribute to the Greatest Generation that D Day scene where every kid in the movie theater was like, oh, dear God, that's what Grandpa did during the war. Oh, my God. Can you even imagine how horrible it was? <laughs> to be beaten out by a fucking uh, a Tom Stoppard screenplay about, uh, about the, the sort of the, a very writerly movie about the genesis behind Romeo and Juliet starring Gwyneth Paltrow and the other Fines brother who no one talks about. <laughs> I, yeah, I... Doesn't Gwyneth Paltrow show her tits in that movie too? Uh, I think that might does. be why she wins. Yeah, <laughs> indeed I think that she might does. Be why it won. Um, <laughs> but I do think that um, Fablemans is my second place pick. I think if it's not Women Talking, it's def- it's going to be Fablemans, just because um, I do think I don't see anyone but Spielberg getting director here this year. Just because I think the Academy, what they'll do is they'll ignore someone very pointedly for a very long time. And then they'll give them like kind of a pity award, like or not a pity award, but like a makeup award after like years of ignoring them. Kind of like how um, like Leo with the Revenant. Yeah, like how um, uh, Scent of a Woman, uh, Pacino won for Scent of a Woman, but that was the year Malcolm X was. So then they had to give um, Denzel... Um, training day yeah training day instead of Malcolm X because they had to give it to Pacino that year and it creates this like weird domino effect and how they like didn't give it to Leonardo DiCaprio for so long I still don't think he has one does he no he won for the Revenant okay yeah he finally won for the Revenant instead of the Aviator or Wolf of Wall Street which I think yeah much better much better movies and performances Mm -hmm. or uh, what's even Gilbert Grape yeah that too uh, Hessa, but but did you? What are your thoughts on the Fablemans? Did you like this movie? I just watched it like a couple hours ago for the first time, and I was floored. I was like, "Whoa, he really wants to have sex with his mom." Yep. I was like, "This is crazy! <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe what I'm seeing." There's a scene where his mom is like dancing in front of the car headlights, and like they're illuminating her white dress and they're like oh we can see through your dress and he's like lovingly filming it with with his dad and her his mom's lover just like the three of them all just watching like enraptured by this dance and i was like oh my god this is crazy i like for for the exactly the reasons you laid out hessa i i found the fablements fascinating because it is the only Steven Spielberg that movie that I can think of that really foregrounds sex and, and like because like his movies are pretty sexless. Like, you know, the, the sex is implied in like Indiana Jones, you know, like uh, it's uh, usually off screen. There's one totally insane sex scene in Munich. Do you remember that one? I don't. <laughs> I <actually> OK, don't. <laughs> there is a very graphic sex scene where Eric Bana has sex with his like third trimester pregnant wife. Oh, my God. Yes, like after years, that. like after spending the last 12 years or something like assassinating Palestinian terrorists, he comes <laughs> home to like where she's living in Brooklyn and they have sex. And he just like really he really opens up the throttle and he's like <laughs> screaming and there's like sweat <laughs> flying off his head as Steven Spielberg intercuts with the uh, depiction of the Munich athletes getting fucking smoked at that airstrip in fucking Munich. <laughs> it's, it's insane. He's I mean, so like, cool. Like that, He's previously, like, that's how he uh, conceives of sex, you know? Like, but yeah. in the Fablemans, from the very first scene, I was fascinated by, they take uh, Paul Dano and Michelle Williams, who plays uh, Spielberg's parents, or the Spielberg character's parents, uh, they take it. They take him to see uh, a movie, The Greatest Show on Earth, and in that movie, there's uh, there's um, a, a train uh, a train derailment. Talk about you know topical, <laughs> to yeah. topical subject. <laughs> topical, yeah. <laughs> but there's a train derailment, and then uh, young the young Spielberg character like uses a model train set and like toys to film and recreate to restage this uh, this train disaster, and there was something to me so like orgasmic about like like in the mind of like like a a pre-adolescent child the idea of like the bigness of cinema and its movement and this explosion of color and movement and then disaster as being like uh, incredibly sexually charged and his need to refilm and restage this disaster as a kind of this like primal freudian scene of 
finding a means to control uh, one's one's own sexuality and the sexuality of one's parents. And it was this it was like, like so Freudian, truly. Yeah. It was crazy. Because they're also like, um, he keeps crashing the train and then Paul Dano's like, this train is expensive. You can't keep crashing it. And his mom is like, I'll tell you what we can do. You crash it one more time and you film it. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can watch the tape over and over again. <laughs> but don't tell your dad. Don't tell your dad about the film. <laughs> it's like, oh my I mean, God. I, w- I was really impressed by this movie because, like, Spielberg is a guy that's like, you know, uh, un- unlike directors of um, a, like a similar class, like let's say like Brian De Palma or whatever, who always directs with one hand down his pants. Like, I've always thought Spielberg mm-hmm. like shaded. Um, human sexuality or like his own sexuality and in this movie he's really putting it all front and center and I was really fascinated by the way this movie connects especially in young boys and young men a, a you know for lack of a better word movie mindset with a kind of like a, a perversity and horniness and in this movie his um his yen his, his this this unconscious drive to produce and make movies and to keep making them uh, leads to like the revelation of like capturing on film and then editing together in the process, the realization that your father is being cucked by Seth Rogen. <laughs> so when, when I saw that it was Seth Rogen, cause it took me a few scenes. Cause I was like, there's no way that's Seth Rogen. <laughs> but when I realized that I was like, wow, that's good for good for him. Wow. Like a Spielberg movie. That's big time. But I also love the David Lynch cameo as John. I mean, Ford. this is, I mean, they, they, I, you know, I, I feel like I feel like that scene was almost cheating in a way. Yeah. Cause like, like for, <laughs> for the movie heads out there, when you got the the last scene of this movie, you've got David Lynch just coming on and stealing the whole fucking movie, playing John Ford, and, and like a, a recreation of a real moment that happened with Spielberg and John Ford to like you know like the the final thing outside of the uh, the, the 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 primal scene of uh, witnessing your parents having sex like the thing that that really charges like sends him on the path that we all know Spielberg to have achieved is this astonishing moment with uh, the great filmmaker David Lynch playing the you know probably even more like the even more uh, like a titanic filmmaker in American history John Ford and you know he's like smoking the cigar he's all curmudgeonly and the lesson he gives them about how to use the horizon uh, when you stage a shot was uh, v- a very fun. And like and I, I said, I thought that I was loved, sort of a cheat code. Yeah, and I love the last shot, how when he's walking out of the studio, um, the camera, like, at the very end of the shot, pans up, like, to correct it so that the horizon's on the bottom yes, instead of yes, in the middle. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. This is, like I said, this, 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 it was sort of a cheat code for movie perverts, but I really appreciated that this movie was about an interest in the cinema and movies as a kind of sexual perversion. And yeah. has a, are you familiar with the, the Lou Reed song, uh, How Do You Speak to an Angel? I'm not, actually. Okay. I basically think The Fablemans is, an adapta- is a film adaptation of the lyrics to that song. The opening lyrics are, A son who is cursed with a harrowed and mother, or a weak, simpering father at best, is raised to play out the timeless classical motives of filial love and incest. So <laughs> the movie is an adaptation of a Lou Reed song, and then the, it goes, How do you speak? How do you speak to the prettiest girl in the world? Baby, you just say hello. Well, Spielberg answers that question, How do you speak to the prettiest girl in the world? You just cast her in a movie. Yeah. <laughs> now, Hessa, what did you make of the fact that uh, there's been some commentary about the inclusion of high school Spielberg, uh, his sort of shiksa girlfriend, which people have subsequently come out to say he didn't have a girlfriend in high school. This is made up for the movie. <laughs> he met John Ford and got a job working in movies uh, after, you know, like after meeting the greatest American filmmaker. But he was not getting pussy in high school. <laughs> Do you think that That's this is so uh, do you think this is an illegitimate uh, contribution to his own life story by him and Mr. Kushner, or uh, do, do you find that this takes you out of the movie, or is this all fair game? Well, you see, I I think maybe it was there to kind of throw the scent off from the mom stuff a little bit, um, but I also think that it was really interesting that she's like hyper like Christian, like super super Christian. Yeah, and I love her. Like she's having a kind of a similar thing that he's having with his mom, but she's having it with Jesus because she's <laughs> yeah. like so sexually obsessed with Jesus. She has like a wall covered in like pictures of Jesus and pictures of like 
I don't know, like Jimmy Dean or whatever, whoever the fucking country star was back then that was hot. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think it's it's a nice a parallel to his own like moment. You know? Yeah, I mean, like uh, m- movies, Jesus, uh, Roy Rogers or Jimmy Dean, you know, they, they, all, yeah. they all come to us <laughs> at night, you know? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so uh, moving on to from the Fablemans, uh, I have another movie a uh, Best Picture nominee that I think is an adaptation of a song that I just have stuck in my head. And that song is Cruel to Be Kind by Nick Lowe. As it goes, you got to be cruel to be kind in the right measure. And of course, I'm talking about the Banshees of Inishirin, a movie about whether it is better to be cruel or kind. Uh, so your thoughts on the Banshees of Inishirin? I love this movie. I thought it was so good. I, I love like, it as well. I think it's also maybe a dark horse because, like, again, I think the Academy always does this thing or in the past, like, 10 years at least, they've been doing this thing where they pick the one no one expects them to pick, like, on purpose. I mean, most of the years. Like, I think Spotlight, everyone knew that was going to win, like, um, certain other ones. But, like, uh, for the most part, like, you know, Green Book, Coda, um, I think they kind of pick like a weird dark horse this year it might i don't know i could see banshees winning like uh, i could easily see it winning too um it, it, it's a small movie but it like it is very much an oscars kind of movie i thought it was great uh i left the theater to the, <laughs> after seeing that movie i left the theater profoundly depressed and like that that's usually a good sign that a movie works uh but to me like the banshees of inisherin is all about a showcase for four astonishingly good acting performances. And we can get into that when we get into the acting. But like, I mean, you got, but Colin Farrell and Brendan Gleeson are always great together. But then you got Kerry Condon and Barry, uh, Barry Keogh, or uh, fuck, I don't know if Barry Keegan. His name. Barry Keegan, yeah. Who are fucking fantastic. And this movie is really nasty, really funny, and just really, really sad. And mm-hmm. Martin McDonough, I've I've been sort of hot and cold on him. Like in Bruges, I thought was great. I did not like Seven Psychopaths. I did not like Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Another big Oscars movie is that I that that was a whiff for me. Mm-hmm. And I didn't like that movie because I thought he was uh, straying a little bit out of his lane in trying to comment on sort of like red state America and make it like sort of a sort of a commentary about Trump's America. And I thought he was like swinging. Uh, I thought he was playing a game that he w- he didn't quite know the rules of. Well, Whereas he, he like he, all his characters are like his male characters are written like 10 year olds and his female characters are written like moms. And that's like the only two types of character he can write. So well, like three billboards, that's, I feel like that's why just, it didn't like mash. Well, it may, it may not work in a uh, 21st century American context, but man, oh man, does it work in a like early 20th century Irish context. And now I, I talked about this movie with, um, uh, Chet and Andrew on E1's pop that corn episode. And we, we all really liked this movie. But one of the things I really like uh, enjoyed about the Banshees of Inisherin was that I think I was probably like a good quarter or a third of the way into the movie before I'd realized what actual year or time like era it was taking place in. Because mm-hmm. for the like until you see a calendar or like that says 1923 and then like the references to the Irish Civil War that's ongoing very much in the background of this movie. I thought this movie could have taken place during the American Civil War or like the Vietnam era. <laughs> It's like breaking because the waves, how, like yeah. when the helicopter flies in. Kind yeah. Of. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because of how essentially fucking backwards and yeah. provincial, like <laughs> rural Ireland is, and it's like the, the, this mythical Aran Island. Like it's it's a, it's supposed to be one of the Aran Islands, but it's a it's a fictional Aran Island. There is no island of Inisherin, I believe, and it's like this microcosm of Ireland where it's like one tiny island oh and then right next to it an even tinier island that represents like all of the distilled psychological pathologies of the irish people which is that basically everyone is just waiting to die but no one can kill themselves because of the catholic <laughs> church and like you know there's always you know there's the gay priest there's the uh, the local the local rap scallion who's a bit of an outcast but that's only because his father sexually abuses him 
And then there's like the woman who hasn't had 30 kids by the time she's 25 and is sort of like an outcast as well because of that. But uh, what did you make of like, because The Bad News of Inna Sharon is very much a movie about male friendship and male psychology. But I thought it also provided a really interesting portrait in the sister played by Carrie Condon of like this this competing um, depictions of male and female loneliness and how they manifest themselves. And I'm wondering mm-hmm. if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I thought I thought it was like really interesting. And I think like he really like, I don't know, hit that nail on the head in a weird way that he doesn't with his female characters in like, you know, in Bruges or Seven Psychopaths or especially like Three Billboards where... It's like, it really does feel like she's a person. It doesn't feel like she's like this weird caricature of like a mom, you know, even though she is kind of a mother figure, I think like, and the contrast between her and like the weird aunt that always, (laughs) that no one wants to hang out with, (laughs) my favorite (laughs) character. Oh yeah. And also, um. Every Irish village also has to have some sort of witch that gives um, ominous prophetic statements as well. (laughs) When um, Colin Farrell is like, why does she have to come over? And she's like, I don't want her to come over either, but she's coming over. (laughs) And I saw like her as kind of like a weird combination of where like Colin Farrell could be in the future and where his sister could be if she stays there. Like, because Colin Farrell... You know, he's lost basically his fr- his one friend and is like alone and the people that he would want to hang out with don't want to really hang out with him. And then the sister is like needs to kind of escape and spread her wings by going to like, you know, like Dublin or wherever she goes, <laughs> like the mainland, which is yeah, a town with like a hundred more people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's literally. Where, that's where she escapes to. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, like, I, I, I loved, I loved Colin Farrell's performance in this movie. I think this is probably like, I, I think this may be his best role, in my opinion, because it's so, it's very against type for the, uh, like the, the Colin Farrell characters that uh, we know and love, where he's usually like this very witty, dangerous, like sexy kind of like, yeah, yeah, a, a dark, uh, very, very sharp guy and like a very charged. And in this movie, he's just like, I believe as one character describes him, like one of God's good guys. You know, and I think the movie, <laughs> the movie asks kind of a disturbing question, which is that like in, in the contrast between Colin Farrell's character and Brendan Gleeson's, we see two men that are desperately lonely and miserable. But Colin Farrell is sort of like too nice and a little bit too like a little not smart enough to realize no. how how lonely and like depressed depressed he really is. Whereas mm-hmm. Brendan Gleeson's character has these artistic pretensions of like having his his shitty like uh, his shitty jiggity jig music uh, outlast <laughs> his, his his boring miserable life. But like and that, that's why he severs his friendship with Colin Farrell because he's like, I want to dedicate the time I have left to like composing my music, and I just I don't want to be weighed down by having the same fucking conversation every day at the pub with this guy who wants to tell me about the last time his donkey took a shit. It's it's like everyone. It's so devastating when because like everyone in town is basically telling Colin Farrell what they all seem to know and which he doesn't is that and that it's he's boring and. Every like one takes him aside and has to tell him in like they're a different way. And it's like really heartbreaking. It's like, oh my God, this poor guy. But At, w- which is why I think it's so important to have the inclusion of the sister who tells uh, Brendan Gleeson at one point when he's like, it, when he's, uh, you know, uh, reiterating for like the seventh time that like, I've looked nothing against the guy. He's just boring. He's not interesting to me. And she just breaks down and says, none of you, none of you men are fucking interesting. You're all <laughs> boring. Like none of you have, like, do you know what it's like to live on this fucking island with you? But <laughs> like none of you are that special or intelligent or fucking interesting. And like when he gets Mozart, like the dates of Mozart, when Mozart composed wrong and she corrects him on that, like, He's mm-hmm. not like he's not that smart. And the Carrie Condon character is clearly the most intelligent person on this island. And that's why she has to fucking leave first chance she gets. Mm-hmm. And then um, and then uh, Barry Keegan's character was also uh, fantastic as the sort of like uh, <laughs> the weird outcast who's just kind of like always around. And he has like, you know, he's in love with the sister. And I really love that scene with them at the end. Where he's like, oh, you know, he's like, we both call old we both call old people ghouls. We got that in common. So, do you want to maybe uh, get to get to go on a date with me or whatever? And then, <laughs> of course, he kills himself. <laughs> yeah. 
And yeah, it's like so funny because Colin Farrell's like, I'm all alone now. And Barry Keegan's like, well, you, you have me. And he's like, yeah, well, you don't really count. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. It's like so yeah. sad. It's like a, a, a chain of loneliness that's yeah. just getting like broken over time. And I mean, like, if you want to talk about like the images in movies that will haunt me for like, the, the, <laughs> haunt me for probably as long as I live. It's like after his sister leaves and we see all those scenes of Colin Farrell alone in his house with his animals where there's just like the cow in his bedroom. And of course, we have to get to the most heartbreaking moment in film probably this year or the last decade mm -hmm. is the death of Jenny the donkey, which was absolutely gutting. R.I.P. R.I.P. Jenny. I was so sad. It was. God, it was. It, it really it hurts me to think about. It really hurts me to think about. But like the whole movie, uh, you know, Colin Farrell and his sister live together and she's always telling him, like, stop letting the animals in the house. And he's like, oh, come on. It's just Jenny. And then as soon as he <laughs> leaves, he's just alone staring at a fire with like a cow standing next to him. And it's just <laughs> yeah. it's <laughs> so heartbreaking. It's yeah. just so heartbreaking. <laughs> the only other woman in his life. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I like. You remember, like, the, the old crone uh, pr prophesizes a number of deaths. And, mm -hmm. like, I was always I was waiting for the third one. But then I realized the third one was Jenny. Oh, yeah, it's because, Jenny. Jenny's the third one. He buries her as a person and gives her a named grave. Yeah, it's so sad. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's, like, heartbreaking. <laughs> Poor Colin Farrell. Yeah, yeah. You just want to fly to the island and just, like, have a beer with him. <laughs> Hang out, <laughs> you know? All right. Um... Okay, moving on from uh, Banshee's Vinny Sharon to uh, a, a very interesting movie, Hessa, that I know that you're a big fan of. And I also was surprised by how good I thought it was. Boz Lerman's Elvis. I loved Elvis. Yeah, you, you were I... a big fan of Elvis. And I was actually like, I went into Elvis, like I, I saw this movie on my birthday in Los Angeles. And I, and I chose it for my birthday movie because I was expecting a ludicrous disaster. But... I found it was actually a very good musical biopic centered around a truly great performance by Austin Butler as Elvis. No, he was killing it. I was like, I was losing it. I literally in the theater, just like screaming, crying. Like I couldn't believe what I was watching at parts. Like the the famous he's white moment where <laughs> he's, he's white and all of the... Those like five separate scenes where Elvis is like doing something in his career and sees civil rights happening on yeah. TV. Yeah, and yeah. he's like, I should have been there. <laughs> <laughs> it's so funny to try and like shoehorn that into Elvis's life. <laughs> it's uh, like... I mean, like the centerpiece of this movie, which was like sound it's it, it, it sounds ludicrous to describe, and it is. But it work <laughs> like it it works in the reality like the movie creates such a sort of um I don't know, all-encompassing reality. The, 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 the ludicrous centerpiece of this movie is the idea that like Elvis basically um, brought America back from the brink following the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. by doing a televised Christmas special in which he performed an original song that was like, we gotta, we gotta love each other. You know, like it was an original <laughs> yeah. song about how like, hey people, like come on, we, let, let's do better. And like the whole middle part of that movie where Tom Hanks's character is running around reassuring TV executives that he will do it a nice Christmas song. Like he's just <laughs> running around in a ridiculous Christmas sweater going, he will do it a jingle let's trust me and Elvis is like yeah we, we got to talk about some some more important than Christmas we got to talk about <laughs> he ends he fixes race relations by wearing leather on daytime TV <laughs> 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 literally that's what happens <laughs> I like Tom Hanks's performance is one of the most insane performances I've ever seen in a movie in my life it's now, so people, people have been very critical of this but I thought it worked very well in the movie like it was it was so but like everything in this movie is over the top but it, like I think it is all very much of a piece of like Boz Lerman and its subject matter oh but, yeah like I mean the way that I mean I thought it was like actually pretty ballsy of like how much the Colonel Tom Parker character and Tom Hanks's portrayal of him 
leaned into this like really seedy feeling of like kind of like a Dutch uh, fucking uh, like a sort of seedy <laughs> Dutch pedophile base. I'm not pedophile, but a guy. Yeah. As, as I said in my preamble, basically was just like what he sees in Elvis is like a nice piece of rough trade that he can yeah, like, really he do sees something a twink. with. Yeah. yeah, and I love how the movie basically ends when Elvis stops being a twink. They treat it like his death yeah. scene, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Twink death. Yeah. It is a movie about twink death. <laughs> And well, has, I, I've always been a huge defender of Baz Luhrmann. I've I love Moulin Rouge. I love Romeo plus Juliet. I love those movies. I'm not a big, you know, Great Gatsby or Australia fan, but I do Moulin Rouge. I will defend to my dying I'm, day. I'm not a fan of Australia, the movie or the nation. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Period. Or any of the people in it. <laughs> but yeah, like you know, like uh, Baz Luhrmann, like like say what you will about his movies, but like they really they move. They have like they, their color, they're bombastic, and like like I said, like I saw Elvis, which is like almost a three hour movie in a theater in which the air conditioning was broke, and I actually turned <laughs> thirty nine during the movie. That's how long it was, and I didn't feel the length of it, even though I got a year older in the theater. There was one point where I was like, I was kind of sick when I went to see it, and I had to like lay down on the ground. <laughs> during one part when he was like um, in Vegas and I was like oh my god I'm gonna die in this theater <laughs> this movie is still going <laughs> but I loved it I like genuinely genuinely loved it and like the scene that really like kind of solidified it for me is the scene where he's playing at this like stadium and it's like he's performing and they depict his like his dance moves the effect that they have on the crowd as like it's all these like still black and white photos of the crowd and it just cuts to like Normandy Beach saving Private Ryan like high pitched ringing noises while it's like showing like <laughs> these teens like going like looking wild eyed it's like a horror movie sequence and I was like this is like one of the best scenes I've seen all year for real I mean, like I, I thought the uh, the the all the the concert scenes in it were fantastic and like it seems so ridiculous like from a 21st century perspective like trying to account for why Elvis truly was like the the king of rock and roll and like the legendary mm -hmm. figure like the like the, the icon of american culture that he is and what that represents is the idea that like oh like well, they're going to put me in jail for the way I move my hips. But, like, <laughs> the movie really does make clear, like, what, yo, as soon as he starts doing those, doing that little jiggling or whatever, like, an audience of, like, a thousand young women and teenage girls, like, come for the first time in their life. Yeah, Like, literally. he introduced sexuality <laughs> to the American mainstream. And it had, like, it was like the Manhattan Project. It was like when they split the atom. And it was yeah. like Elvis just like like letting letting girls feel a little bit of that a little bit of that little bit of a little bit of vibration somewhere inside them. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. And I will say, Austin Butler. Uh, I mean, man, like the the best thing is that he does not do an impersonation of Elvis like I've been doing. Like he doesn't do it like this. Oh, thank you very much. Like he 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 really does not do an impersonation of Elvis at all. And I know everyone's been making fun of the fact that like he still has the voice because of how committed he was to it. Yeah. <laughs> but I felt like I mean like it was it was a credible um rendition of Elvis as a real human being, but in the concert, in the performing and singing scenes, goddamn, like he doesn't really look like Elvis, but goddamn, like he gets the 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 energy and like the charisma and the fucking stage presence of like all his moves and the singing, uh, uh just beautifully. He has the juice. It's like oh, yeah. truly, this is my, my favorite. Like I would give him leading actor for sure if I well, was yeah, giving I mean, out these awards. We'll, we'll get into it. It's gonna be it's gonna be between him and Brendan Fraser. But it's a question about oh, like, yeah, whether, yeah. They, whether they want to apologize for the past or an anoint someone in the future that they'll go on to abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll, <laughs> All right, we'll get a to new that. Twink. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, moving on from Elvis to uh, the movie that, uh, if I were voting I, in terms of like, what do I think is like the best picture of the year in terms of representing like the the, the best of cinema, like as a craft has to offer, it's got to be Todd Field's Tar. Oh yeah, that's my favorite this year. Also, I I have Tar fever. I Tar needs to sweep the Oscars. Tar. Tar won all of the electoral college votes. Um, it's tar all the way. Tar top to bottom. Uh, what did you say the last time we were talking about tar is like the scene where they're going through the assistance like emails and there's just a big email that says tar wants tar me wants dead. me dead. <laughs> tar <laughs> wants me dead. <laughs> all caps. <laughs> so now, funny. Um, 
impossible to talk about this movie without talking about Kate Blanchett, who, you know, a, a, a virtuoso performance here. Um, Truly. And, and like, look, I, w- I will not be mad if Michelle Yeoh wins Best Actress, but... Oh, not at to, all. To, to me, Kate Blanchett, this, this is the performance of the year. Mm-hmm. And now, Tar is a fascinating movie to me because of, like, when I was watching it, it took me, like, almost... 90 minutes into the movie to like really get a handle on like what what is this movie like what am i watching (laughs) because like of how utterly uncanny the first like 20 minutes of the movie are that is just like this extended interview with the real adam gopnik and then this long uh like sort of lunch conversation between her and mark strong by the way mark strong having hair in this movie it took me like 20 minutes to clock that it was mark strong I'm not kidding. I thought it was Stanley Tucci till the credits. <laughs> I'm not kidding. In the entire movie, I thought it was Stanley Tucci. <laughs> but All that right. hair, I was losing it. I was losing it. Now, Tar is probably the most mysterious of the Best Picture nominees in terms of like the hardest to pin down what is it actually about and what is actually going on in it. Now, I know I've shared with you, and I would like to share with our listeners, my sort of like unified field theory of what Tar is. I love is your theory. I what love it's your about. theory. So, um, now you might remember when uh, Tar came out, I think New York Magazine wrote an article about, uh, is Lydia Tar a real person? And it was responding to um, uh, people who saw this movie and then immediately went on Wikipedia to look up Lydia Tar, assuming because of like like how organically the reality of the movie like implied that like Lydia Tar is a, based on a real conductor who had some sort of like Me Too scandal that ruined her. But no, like she's an entirely fictional character and people felt... Um, sort of like betrayed or somehow like confused that she wasn't a real person. But I think this gets to the exact heart of what the movie is about because in my estimation, Lydia Tarr in the reality of the movie is not a real person. Lydia Tarr is the fantasy projection of the career that uh, either that Kate Blanchett's character believes she was owed or would have had if not for being mistreated herself or mistreating others. Now, think, of, think about the opening scene of this movie. It's a, a very important detail of this movie is that uh, one of Lydia Tara's former um, assistants or protégés is a woman who goes on to kill herself later in the movie. And one of the first images we see in the movie, if not, I think, the very first image, like right before the Adam Gopnik interview, you see the back of this woman's head staring from the back of a like large auditorium at this like New Yorker festival, looking down as Lydia Tarr goes on to be interviewed in depth about her like amazing stellar career as the world's greatest conductor, the world's most famous conductor, which is already a clue yeah, the reality of this movie <laughs> is a little bit tweaked that you're not exactly what you're seeing on screen isn't exactly reality as such. It is my contention that the like the Lydia Tarr character is the fantasy projection of the woman who killed herself. And it's very telling at a late point in this movie where Lydia Tarr looks at the obituary of her former assistant and the photo that the Times the fake Times article in the obituary choose, chooses her red hair is obscuring her face. It's like a shock of hair in motion covering her face. This, to me, was a tell that if you could see the woman's face in the obituary, it would be Kate Blanchett. And as the, like, as the movie gets more like weird as it goes on, like there's a scene where Lydia Tarr follows this other young protege into this like sort of seedy Berlin like apartment complex, and only to have her disappear and then fall down and hit her head. From that point on in the movie, the reality begins to break down a little bit. And then we get to the famous final shot of the movie in which the Lydia Tarr character is supposedly exiled to the Philippines to conduct uh, symphony music for a video game convention. (laughs) I think the last third of the movie or like the the, the last 20 or 30 minutes of the movie is the realest part of the movie. And like when when Tarr goes home to that, like it's like this very claustrophobic scene of her going home to like her house. And like she's not Lydia Tarr, she's like the per- she's still that person. She's Linda that- Tarr. <laughs> Linda yeah. Tarr, yeah. Like she's that person who never had the career of being like Leonard Bernstein's protege. She watches the video of Leonard Bernstein talking about like music and conducting that inspired her. And the whole first two thirds of the movie is this like bittersweet like. It's it's like the fantasy that she created for herself can't be maintained any longer, and like just the detail upon detail of her being like an egot 
win- like an EGOT yeah. winner, going on Alec Baldwin's podcast, just the just the even conceit that there is such a thing as the world's most famous conductor. Yeah, it's like <laughs> all all suggests to me a sort of like a, a fantasy reality that breaks down as the movie continues. And like a lot of people have talked about this movie as a ghost story. I think that that's like a, a, definitely like within the bounds of what I'm talking about is that like the ghost she's being haunted by is the ghost of like the reality of her actual life and not the the, the fantasy of like the world's best career in classical music that she feels she was owed um, and then, like, you know, the famous scene of her owning the SJ dub at Juilliard, like the reality of that scene breaks down, too, because, like, there's a certain quality to it that has um, it has the quality to me of an argument you have in your head in the shower where you're like, yeah, literally, like, like, like this that's is how, how I would, I would own, own this, like, uh, imaginary person who tries to tell me that Bach isn't important because he's a dead old white man. Yeah, literally. <laughs> and like, also, when they're showing her like video and they're like, we're, we're going to have to, this video just surfaced and it's like a YouTube poop. Like, yeah. it's like cut like a YouTube poop. Yeah, like, they're a clearly, shot, like, reverse shot. Like, yeah. From an angle where there was no student there holding a camera. And when they could have just like posted the video probably of like the actual conversation, yeah. but instead they like edit it because everything has to be everyone working against her in this like weird way, you know, on every level possible. Yeah, but and here's where I get into like the I think one of the more interesting fa- the, one of the more interesting themes explored in Tar is that going into it like all I was aware of was sort of the like commentary around it, which seemed to focus on this idea that it was this kind of like Me Too cancel culture morality tale, which it very much isn't. And if you're going into the movie expecting that, you're going to be very surprised. However, the way the movie deals with Lydia Tar's cancellation, I thought was very interesting. Because I think it's like kind of similar to The Banshees of Inish Sharon, which is another movie I think that is kind of about the vanity of artists and the way they think of themselves as sort of better or different than everyone else. I think the way cancellation is portrayed in Tar is in my, in my, in my interpretation of it is, it about how, is it about how cancellation is in fact actually kind of a pleasant fantasy for, for, for artists in a certain sense. Because it means that like you are off the hook for the thing that you thought that you couldn't achieve in the first place. It is a way to kind of like a self immolation it's like a, a desire for self-immolation that lets you off the hook. And that there is something distinctly pleasurable about the idea of being canceled and being like rid of it all. Mm-hmm. And I think that fits with, because I didn't have the same reading you did of like, you know, the Mulholland Drive-esque, you know, like vision before death, like kind of, um, you know, fantasy life flashing before her eyes thing. But it's still like that still fits like even without that, because there are so many chances that she has to like kind of save herself. Like when they're like, "Um, well, this video just came out. We have to discuss this with the people on the board. And so I think it would be really good if you were there. And she's like, well, I can't because I have to read an excerpt from my book. Tar and, on tar. Yeah, tar on tar. <laughs> and this is one of my favorite, one of my other favorite parts is when it shows her um, reading the excerpt from the book and the excerpt from the book is so bad. Yes, <laughs> like, yes. <laughs> yes, there are is many. the movement of the soul or something. <laughs> it's like <laughs> such bullshit. <laughs> yes, there are many hints throughout the movie that tar is a complete bullshit artist. A and complete I, bullshit artist who has like reserved for herself this, 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 uh, like uh, this niche of high culture that really doesn't matter to anyone anymore, and I think like that like that's the point of the last scene of the movie. Like the real joke of it is that like the, like high culture like there, there is no more high culture. It's like video game culture now. Like it's like it's passed you by, mm-hmm. literally. And I do. It's like so fucking funny too. Like I love like no one ever talks about how like hilarious Tar is a lot of the time. Like it's a very one of my. Yeah, it's one of my a very favorite funny moments movie. is um, after she falls um, because she runs from a dog that may or may not have existed. Um, and by the way, well, the first time I saw this movie, I got into a huge fight with my friend because my I was like, "Yeah," and then she saw the creature in the basement, and my friend is like, "What, <laughs> what the fuck are you talking about? What creature? <laughs> that was the dog." And I was like, "That was definitely a creature." <laughs> we got into a huge fight, but. Um, I think we were both right because a dog is a creature at the end of the day. But she it's runs true. from this. She runs from this creature and falls and like smashes her face and then goes into like um, work on the 
conducting the next day and she walks in and her face is all busted up and everyone there's like murmurs from the orchestra and she's like now let's deal with the elephant in the room right away get it out of the way right right now so it's not a big thing weighing on everyone's mind i was attacked and uh, let's get started and then she instantly goes into it. she just says like i was attacked and, like making it even more of a thing than it was before when she didn't say anything it's I so mean, like bpd if you haven't seen tar i think the way to go into the movie like like cuz i said it took me like 90 minutes to like get my arms around what exactly i was like what what this movie really was but i think if you go into it understanding that it is an, an incredibly dry comedy and you know maybe this is a little too easy, but like I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna put my marker on this. Directed by Todd Field, who you might remember as one Nick Nightingale from the Stanley Kubrick film Eyes Wide Shut. Him and Stanley had a you know a, a working relationship. They were very close with one another. And I can't help it but interpret this movie as I do all Kubrick movies. Is that the way to understand all of them? Is that they are all incredibly cold and incredibly dry comedies of manners. And that is, I think, basically the key to understanding Tar. Absolutely. And I, like, when I first saw this, I saw it in theaters. I saw, like, most of these movies in theaters, honestly, which is really surprising. This was a really good year for movies, I think. Um, and I, when I first saw Tar, I w saw it with, like, four friends. And I took an edible before going in. Uh, this and, is so this is movie mindset now oh, yeah exactly movie exactly i the edible hit like um before the like right when the movie started and for the first like literal maybe 15 to 20 minutes i was laughing hysterically because the you edible know, like max bit, katie and uh cape fear like yeah literally novelty size cigar everyone in the movie are like looking rudely at you just thinking, yeah like, yeah who is this I person <laughs> I was like, this is not funny. This is about <laughs> this is about me too. Well, but like the first like fifteen to twenty minutes is literally almost incomprehensible. The list yes. of accolades that <laughs> yes. the New York the um, New Yorker person like Adam reads Gopnik. off is like five and a half minutes long. And right when you think it's going to be over, he just keeps like spitting out more and more like accolades and the the dinner the lunch scene after where they're like. Oh yeah, the tremolo on the second uh, movement is You're like, what the fuck absolutely... are these people talking about? <laughs> like, what are they talking about? But I gotta say, like, the uncanniness of how on point that was, like, particularly just as it relates to my experiences in the publishing industry and the world of, like, I've been at so many of those type those those events that Adam Gopnik, if not him specifically, were moderating, and like, they all feel like that. But like, even then, I had the attitude of just being like, what is what is this? What am I looking at? Who the fuck are these people? <laughs> And just my, my, my one last thought about Tar is I think, like, like I said, like I think the skeleton key to the movie is in the opening interview between her and Adam Gopnik. And one of the first things she says about conducting is very interesting. And she talks about how as the conductor, she's in control of time. And like, like, like in a piece of music or a film or like, you know, like, like any, any piece of art in which like you as the experience are traversing time with an artist like even if the artist has been dead for centuries it's this it's this sense that like through art we can um like set the tempo but like that the the artist the person in control gets to like basically rewrite and control time and and like cross time and even death and like that's really what the hope of art is but i think like in that you get a hint into the kind of like the self mythology and the kind of um, self invention and the control of one's own narrative that I think is kind of a key to the kind of the more the unrealities of the movie or the, the dream like aspects of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think like, and I, I love her like in that interview at the beginning, I was like, Oh, this bitch is smart. Like, <laughs> and, like, it kind of, <laughs> it kind of like, <laughs> As as it goes, yeah, I, need, on, like, I need a, I need a smart bitch like Lydia Tarr, yeah, literally. <laughs> <laughs> I need a bitch to suck at Tar style. <laughs> 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 it's so hard that I gotta kill myself after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I need that Mahler's Fifth Symphony type of pussy. <laughs> But yeah, um, like all sorts of. I mean, we could talk about Tar all day. Like the yeah, scene where yeah, she's like, actually, 
I got I got one final thing about Tar, and that's just because I saw that fucking nitwit Hassan Minaj make some sort of fucking joke at some award show about how the end of that movie was like pseudo racist because it was like, oh, like the worst thing that can happen to a white woman is that she lives in the Philippines, and I was just like, you fucking Philistine, how dare you say that in front of Kate Blanchett? Take it back, <laughs> asshole. Yeah, literally. I think that just like mis- I think it just mi- misreads the entire movie. It's like really fun, and I I did enjoy how that didn't really get a lot of laughs in the club. No, it was a <laughs> it was fucking bomb. Like, it was a real stinker. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and it's so obvious. It's making fun of like these are like to her. These are smelly video game people. Not like it's not that she's in another country. It's that she's in, not in Berlin. You know, like yeah. conducting the Philharmonic. It could be Iceland or whatever. Like it's just like you know she's at rock bottom she's in the t- bottom of the tar pits truly <laughs> um and what about that scene uh, towards the end of the movie where she goes in to like get a massage and there's like these girls presented to her and mm-hmm. then she's she's asked to choose and the one she chooses is number five for the fifth symphony the missing piece of her entire career that's been leading up to doing all of Mahler symphonies the fifth one being the final piece that she never achieves and is left missing i think is like you know Another little clue or something to consider. Well, mm-hmm. but, you know, based on the time we've spent talking about it alone, I think it's very clear that Tar is both of our our, our, our choice for best picture of the year. Yeah, I would absolutely. just like to move now quickly through the last two on the list. Have we forgotten anything else? Uh, oh no, there's still three to go. But I'm gonna I'm gonna do pretty quickly Top Gun Maverick and Avatar: Way of Water. I'm not gonna spend too much time on these movies because I've already recorded two full episodes. Yeah, I <laughs> singing feel like their these... praises. <laughs> So, yes. I mean, you can go back and uh, see, you can, you can see my already well-established thoughts on both Avatar The Way of Water and Top Gun Maverick. Needless to say, I love them both. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, same. Same. I Avatar was another one that I saw in theaters way too high off an edible, and I was losing it the whole time. <laughs> I was screaming, okay. yelling and screaming. All right, let's get to the final movie on the Best Picture uh, roster. And uh, th- maybe th- maybe this is one that we'll disagree on. This is certainly this is going to be my least favorite of these movies. I'm talking about Triangle of Sadness, a movie I just saw and hated. Uh, Hosa, <laughs> I'd be interested in your thoughts on this, but like this is maybe this is up there with Infinity Pool, two very related movies, as my least favorite. Like the movie that made I was physically angry leaving the theater <laughs> after watching this fucking piece of shit. Well, but if you I, feel differently, please let's let's debate it out. I texted you about like twenty or so minutes in, and I was like, "I'm watching Triangle of Sadness. This is pretty good. I like this a lot." But I do like my thoughts have changed since finishing the movie because <laughs> I do think like it's three separate movies in like crammed into one. It's like the beginning, and then the part on the boat, and then the part on the island, and each movie is progressively worse by like an order of magnitude than the one before it. And, um, like, I really liked it up until the part where they're talking about where Woody Harrelson and the other guy are talking about marks over the loudspeaker. <laughs> it's like, that Ugh. was like, okay. I was like, <laughs> look, I would take a joke at my expense as a lefty podcaster if it were even slightly funny. Yeah. And <laughs> this movie was just like, what felt like 10 hours of the most crushingly, uh, crushingly heavy-handed satire I've ever experienced. And by the way, I think people, I mean, like, I'm, I'm sort of astounded by how many people are interpreting Triangle of Sadness as some sort of, like, anti-capitalist, scathing piece of anti-capitalist satire. Because I don't know what movie they watch. I think this is very much part and parcel of a lot of movies now that throw out, you know, like, they... they they revel in the in, in the idea that like uh, the rich, i.e., the people watching this movie, are all venal, shallow, selfish cretins, right? Mm-hmm. But like it sort of inoculates the audience from the satire because it's just all about like, oh, we recognize ourselves in this, and by laughing at what g- cruel assholes we are, we're sort of in on the joke, and we like, oh, we know how evil we are. But then I thought like the whole third act of the movie on the island, which was like by far the worst part of the movie. I think just like it, it, it's like, oh, capitalism, socialism, like it's all fucked up. Everyone's selfish. In any situation, there's going to be inequalities of power. And what are people going to do when they have power? Keep it and lord it over others. So I think like the point of the third act of the movie where like the uh, like the, the woman who's like uh, cleaning toilets on the yacht begins like extorting sexual favors from the male model. And look, 
it she, like the power that she has is more justified because mm-hmm. um she actually has skills that are necessary to not die on an island like fishing mm-hmm. and building a fire but at the same time it's just like i think it, it is a movie about reassuring the viewer that hey the people who serve us are just as venal as we are and guess I, what capitalism socialism there's really nothing to be done about any of it because look there's always going to be people with power and people who don't have power and i think like that the the moment that really exemplified that for me in the movie was when um Woody Harrelson, who's the captain of the ship and is um, a Marxist, as he says, um, is talking over the loudspeaker because he's like hammered and the ship is basically like going down and um, it's like filled, like the toilets are overflowing, like shit is like filling the corridors, the power's out and people are just like in like life vests huddled in the halls and it's like a mother and a daughter. And meanwhile, Woody Harrelson's on the speaker like... And you, you people are so privileged. You have no idea how good you have it. And it cuts to like a mother and daughter like huddling for warmth, like in like ankle deep in shit, like in a dark hallway. And it's like, <laughs> wow, this really is making me think. Um, I think like the beginning, like the first like 15 or 20 minutes were my favorite part, like by far. Um I have a friend who's a male model, my friend Reed, and I was like, is that really what it's like? And he was like, yeah, that's exactly what it's like. The casting part at the beginning, I was like... Yeah. And I think, like, that was, like, so much more interesting than, like, the shit on the boat and the stuff on the island. I would have loved to see, like, more goofing off, more of the models goofing off. And there were, like, so many director, like, directing choices that I thought were cool at that part. And, like... You know, the throwing up scene was cool, but yeah, it really falls apart uh, okay. towards I would the admit, end. The throwing up scene, did, I was laughing when everyone was just puking and shitting for like, and yeah. the, way, the way they like, the way they just keep going with that. Like, yeah. you just keep seeing vomit. I thought it was pretty funny, but it was like sandwiched in, like I said, what I felt like was 10 hours of just like the most leaden, un, just not funny, like crushingly unfunny shit I've ever seen in a movie. Uh, when I got done with this movie, I was just, I wanted the director, Ruben Ostland, I was just like, go back to Sweden, motherfucker. We don't <laughs> want your movies here. Fuck off. I, I was like, my favorite thing in the throwing up scene was that, um, all the people, like, all the people in the, like, galley are, like, physically, like, you can tell they're all getting sick. Like, they're all, like, you know, pale-faced, like, stare, the thousand-yard stare. And the um, the surfers keep being, like, if you're feeling sick, you should eat something. <laughs> <laughs> they keep saying it. They say it, like, ten times to ten different people. <laughs> As people are, like, vomiting. <laughs> like, if you feel sick, you should eat something. It's better on a full stomach than an empty stomach. <laughs> I sort of feel like the, like the, the, the same material is being uh, plumbed in the White Lotus. Obviously, I mean a, a show yeah, I do, a show I actually quite like. But the thing is, like as as vicious as the portrayal is of the people, like that 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 it's satirizing. I can't. I mean, like maybe I'm speaking. Maybe I'm revealing like too much about myself here. But like in both Triangle of Sadness and when I watch White Lotus. The single dominating thought I have is, man, I would really like to go on one of these luxury vacations. They look yeah, great. Yeah, like Glass Onion. Like, <laughs> yeah, why is, yeah. Why are there all these weird, like, vacation movies? Infinity like, Pool. Infinity yeah, Pool. Yeah. Like, there's so many of these, like, what is going on? People love, like, a luxury vacation that goes awry, I feel well, like. I, I think it's kind of like a hangover. I think it's like movies are catching up to, like, psychologically what, what, what the COVID lockdown did to people. So I think it's understandable that people are seeking a way out of their fucking house and their daily life mm-hmm. and are working from home. So, like, the vacation has become this very, like, politically and culturally contested terrain and i like what i don't like about all these things is that they're just all sort of about like the nicer the vacation the worse you should feel about it yeah literally and i think it's this half-ass form of like uh guilty liberal like conscience mongering that 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 i that doesn't that really doesn't click with me you know i will say though i think the white lotus is a very good tv show I have. I still have to watch it. I still have to. I haven't seen it. it see, it's funny. The White Lotus is funny, and I think it's like well written, and the characters are good. I've unlike, heard it's really good. I, I love my White. Sadness. Now, uh, before we get into our picks, there's one last movie that that did not make the cut for Best Picture, and uh, nor should it have, in my opinion. However, I still think it's an interesting movie, and I'm wondering if you saw it, Tessa. Have you, I'm sorry, Hessa. Have you seen Babylon? 
I haven't seen Babylon. Okay. I thought you were going to say Blonde, and I was about to okay. sing its Well, actually, praises, I, wanted, but... I do want to ask you about Blonde as well. Yeah. I, I haven't <laughs> seen Blonde because I've been like afraid to because I know it's going to be a, an ordeal to get through. I, I don't know if I'll like it or not like it. I have I do like that uh, director's other movies, mm-hmm. but maybe we can devote another, another episode just to talking about Babylon because it, it's interesting, but it is trademark Lex G, the most bozo mode movie I, think <laughs> I have ever seen. And it, it is fascinating in that regard. I think I've, I've, there's too much to talk about in terms of Babylon without someone who's seen it. But could you quickly tell me about Blonde? Blonde, I really liked it. <laughs> so is, is really... it like, is it a cruel like carnival of torture? Basically, Yeah. <laughs> okay, awesome. I mean, a lot of it is for sure, but it's... It's so like crazy. It's really fucking crazy. And I'm like, I don't know. It's so bold. There's so many insane choices being made. There's so many like breathtaking like shots and like great scenes. Like Anna de Armas is like so good. Um, I think in any other universe, this would be in any other year. This would be like by far and away like um, best actress, like a gimme. Um yeah, I really, I really liked it. It is definitely really cruel and evil. <laughs> no, I mean it's like morally. Right, so I do. I think it should have been made. Probably not. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, like that's a ringing endorsement for a movie, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, yeah. Morally poisonous to the soul. I think yeah. it's a good, good review of a movie. And there are so many scenes that like hit. There are like so. There are a lot of scenes that just completely miss to the point where it's like laughable. But there are so many crazy scenes like her like sucking off JFK while he has his back brace on and the, okay. the moon, the rocket launch is on TV in the background of them like launching the Apollo rocket. And like as he's nutting, <laughs> he's just watching this rocket like take off. And, um, you know, the CIA um, kind of um, aborting kidnapping her and aborting her baby with JFK like in a horrifying scene where she like wakes up and it's like literally silence of the lambs like night vision goggles um and her house is filled with like g-men that are hiding in corners and she's like in the dark like fumbling for the light switch it's like really crazy there are so many crazy shots like that there's like the music is really weird i think the music is really funny i don't think it's good but because it's like but there are like these weird like moments where these weird decisions like i don't know there's so many like compounding insane decisions and joyce carol oates is like such a good writer i feel like she gets lumped in with like james patterson stuff like as like um airport book fair but she's like actually genuinely like a really talented writer well, she's been um, on fire on Twitter lately. You yeah, know? and <laughs> she's she's on fire and she's spitting. <laughs> like, I love her. Well, has say here here's here's my most important question about Blonde. Is it true that Anna de Armas is basically naked the entire movie? And uh, what are her tits like? Because you know, I I, I I I still remember Gwyneth from Shakespeare in Love. Yeah, but like I, I found this movie is quite generous with Anna de Armas being naked, and you know, uh. Yes, in the context of a deeply unpleasant carnival of uh, horror and sadism. But like, am I going to enjoy seeing Anna de Armas naked, or am I going to feel bad for wanting to see her naked? I think it's you're probably going to feel bad. <laughs> okay, I think, all right. I think see, you this might is enjoy why I've avoided seeing this movie. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's never in like a good context. <laughs> it's always in a pretty bad mode. Like, yeah, and Adrian Brody shows up playing Arthur Miller, which. I really took me nice. off guard. I was, I like leaned over in the theater in the theater and like whispered to my girlfriend, like that's Adrian Brody. <laughs> <laughs> Does someone play uh, Edward G. Robinson Jr.? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, they cool. got like a twink to play. They got two twinks to play Edward G. Robinson Jr. and Char- Charlie Chaplin Jr. Um, Don't they like they, double team her at one point? Yeah, they have a thruple. They have like it's the happiest years of her life when she's okay. like, um, you know, with in this like threesome thing with them but um yeah it wasn't meant to be unfortunately all right well th- uh, th- those are some of the uh, uh some of the ones that didn't make the cut so all right let's get into the balloting best picture all quiet on the western front avatar the way of water banshees of anna sharon elvis everything everywhere all at once the fablemans tar top gun maverick triangle of sadness women talking hessa you've already made the you've already put your marker down a bold 
bold mm-hmm. like, long shot prediction of women talking yes. winning <laughs> and, and and you agree with me that if you were voting you'd probably vote for tar like that's the one you'd like to see win absolutely yeah okay now the chalk pick for this is everything everywhere all at once i think that's probably going to win but if i'm filling out my ballot here i just can't go with chalk so i think i'm going to go with the fablemans because hollywood loves movies that jack off itself yeah, I think I think that's my second pick, like very close second behind Women's Hawking, which makes me insane. But I don't know. I got to go with my gut. I got to go with my my heart. <laughs> All right. Let's get into the acting or no, uh, best director. OK, best director first. Uh, Martin McDonough, Banshees of Inner Sharon, The Daniels for Everything Everywhere All at Once, Spielberg for The Fablemans, Todd Field for Tar and Ruben Ostland for Triangle of Sadness. Uh, who, who do you think you, you said Spielberg? You think you think they're going to give it to Spielberg for this one because they like uh, you I know think, just this, a career summation. Um, I think it's either. Um, I think if Fablemans wins Best Picture, they'll give it to Todd Field. They'll give director yeah. to Todd Field. But I you're think right. I think it's Fablemans will either win Best Director or Best Picture, but not both. Yeah, I agree. But um, um, yeah, other than that, I think Spielberg. I think is going to be the clear winner here. Yeah, I think I, I don't think they're going to give it to the Daniels. I think they're too young and the movie is a little too wacky. I think mm-hmm. it is probably going to be either Spielberg or Todd Field, and I'd like to see Todd Field win. But it's oh, hard yeah. for me to imagine Ruben Osland or Martin McDonough winning, uh, winning anything mm-hmm. in this category. Yeah. Uh, all right, Best Actress. Kate Blanchett for Tar, Ana de Armas for Blonde, Andrea Riseborough for Two Leslie, Michelle Williams for The Fablemans, and Michelle Yeoh for Everything Everywhere All at Once. Now, I agree with you. I think that this is a two-person race between Michelle Yeoh and Kate Blanchett. Michelle Yeoh has already won uh, like the preceding um, uh, awards, like the Golden Globes and uh, a couple of the other ones, I think. Like, so she's, she's in the pole position right now, having won these awards. But often the Oscars go, they'll, and at least one actor or actress, they'll cut against the Golden Globes and the Hollywood Foreign Press. So this one, I think Michelle Yeoh will win it. But I think Kate Blanchett should win it. But either way, I'm not mad at it. I, yeah, I think whoever wins, we win. It's like the opposite of Alien versus Predator, <laughs> <Yeah>. where <laughs> it's, you know, um, two, two dynamite actresses. And I'm going to be so happy for either of them. Or Andrea Riseborough. <laughs> if Andrea well, Riseborough won, that would be so funny. Well, Andrea Riseborough, I won't be mad at her either just because of Mandy. You know? yeah. Like to me, that, that'll be like her getting the award for Mandy. Mm hmm. I, right. I loved her grassroots, her weird grassroots campaign. That was good on her. <laughs> we, we need more people lobbying, lobbying for themselves. Yeah. You know, Absolutely. Uh, best actor, Austin Butler for Elvis, Colin Farrell for The Banshees of Inisherin, Brendan Fraser for The Whale, Paul Mezgal for After Sun, and Bill Nighy for Living. Now, to me, that this is also, again, a two-person race. It's either going to be Austin Butler or Brendan Fraser. I think Brendan Fraser will win it, because Hollywood would like to apologize to him for uh, raping him. Um, yeah, I do. Then, I like, think he's going to win too. Yeah. I did you see the whale? <laughs> I have not seen the. I whale have not yet. seen it either. It's one of those movies that just like I know I'm going to hate probably, and it seems like an absolute ordeal. I. It looks like I'm like I'm just going to be so sad. I want to watch it. Ben. Ben was like, "Do you want to watch? Do you want to go see the whale in theaters? It looks so funny." And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> it looks so sad. <laughs> It's like, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> like Austin Butler, I think he's like a- ascendant right now. And I th- like I said, it's like, I think they're going to apologize to the guy whose career they did fuck up and abuse. And they're going to uh, do that and anoint Austin Butler as the next guy that they're going to fuck up and abuse. However, yeah. if I were voting, I would like to see Colin Farrell uh, win this award. I could see him winning, honestly. I think like... Yeah, I think he he has a horse in the race. I don't think um I don't even know what that Bill Nye movie is. I truly like have never even heard of it. No, um, I have no no idea. I think it's based on a Kazu uh Ishiguro novel. I think it's about an old gay British guy basically. Okay, awesome. And I really want to see After Sun. I think I'm going to watch it after this. Okay, I well, rented it. I, I will use Paul Mescal's um a nomination for best actor here to talk about After Sun a movie that I thought was fantastic. I thought it could easily probably could be in the best picture contention. It's one of the better movies I've seen this year. I don't want, it's one of those movies that like, uh, don't like, like 
try not to read too much about it before you watch it because I think the effect of the movie is best going in cold. But it is a, it is a, it portrays a vacation taken between a father and daughter who's like, you know, she's like, like young teenage years and her father, played by Paul Mescal, is very young. Like, you know, it's like she's like a, I think she's about like 12 or 13 years old in the movie. I think he had, clearly had the daughter when he was like 20 or 19 or something like that. How shall I put this? This is a movie that the entire, it's, it's a very quiet, intimate, and like deeply felt movie about a relationship between a father and a daughter and about how like the memories we have as childhood, uh, the memories that we have of people in our childhood are really all we have of them. In one point, like I think it's a, it's a very devastating and sad movie about memory and, and family. And all I'll say about it is that like both of the lead performances of Paul Mescal and the girl who plays his daughter, uh, Frankie Corey, I believe, is one of the best performances by a child actor I've ever seen in the movie. It's one of the most realistic and like credibly oh, wow. portrayed like y young people I've seen in a movie. I don't want to give too much away about the movie. All I will say is that like the whole movie, it had my heart in a vice from like the first 15 minutes of it. And I was just waiting for like the other shoe to drop and for something bad to happen. And I like, I guess spoiler alert, I'm giving away a lot by saying nothing bad does happen in the movie, but it, the ending is so, so devastating because of that. After Sun is a movie I highly recommend. It is a really, I was really affected by it. And you want to talk about a movie that made me cry at the end of it. After Sun really, really gutted me. Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm definitely going to watch it after this then. Okay. Moving on to my favorite categories, the supporting actor categories. Best supporting actress, we have Angela Bassett for Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. <laughs> Hong Chow for The Whale. Uh, Carrie Condon for The Banshees of Inisherin, Jamie Lee Curtis for Everything Everywhere All at Once. And uh, Stephanie, uh, how do you pronounce her last name, Hessa? I think it's Sue. I think it's Ste Stephanie Sue. Stephanie Sue for Everything Everywhere All at Once. Uh, to me, that this is once again, this is a two person race between Angela Bassett and Jamie Lee Curtis. Like, and it's just a question of like, which one of these grand dames would they like to give a career achievement award? I think this is the one I'm going to put my marker down. I think I, Jamie Lee Curtis will win it, and I think she should. However, if I was voting, I would probably vote for Carrie Condon's performance mm -hmm. in The Banshees of Inna Sharon. But it's either Angela, Angela Bassett, which is like, look, Angela Bassett's great, but I just cannot bear to see someone get rewarded for being in Black Panther or Wakanda forever. Yeah, I think I don't see um, Angela Bassett getting it for that. I, if I was giving the award, I would probably give it to Hong Chao because that's my girl. I haven't seen The Whale yet, but I think she should win probably because I love her and she probably does a really good job in it. Um, <laughs> I really love her as an actress. Like her part in in. in, in in um inherent vice like i think she has the best line delivery in a movie that is all like a plus line deliveries um which is when she's talking about how her roommate can't stop um can't stop like listening to spotted dick this band and is like kind of going off to joaquin phoenix about it i love her in everything um i'll probably end up seeing the whale just because of her but I think um, Stephanie Sue might take it. I think odds are, I think she would probably win it before Jamie Lee Curtis, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I really don't know if, I really don't know. You know, it's anyone's game in this category, I think. Then Best Supporting Actor, Brendan Gleeson for Banshees of Inna Sharon, Brian Tyree Henry for a movie called Causeway that I've fucking never, <laughs> no idea what that movie <laughs> <the> is. <laughs> It's it's everyone's favorite place to drive a car. Um, <laughs> Judd Hirsch for the Fablemans, uh, Barry Keegan for the Banshees of Inisherin, and K. Hey Kwan for everything, everywhere, all at once. Uh, this is the easiest one, in my opinion. It's K. Hey Kwan for everything, everywhere, all at once. Oh yeah, this absolutely. Is, this is With this the is the one that's the lock because just of him, like just the narrative of him as an actor, him on all these talk shows, just the fact that like he spent like. 20 years just out of the industry and now just like to come back like this 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 is irresistible this is like this is an absolute lock it's Kehei Kwan all the way and I don't know I I, I would probably vote for Brendan Gleeson because I like him so much but Kehei Kwan was really good in I would uh, everything everywhere all at once I, 
I really liked him in it. I his like softness and like all the parts where he's in Hong Kong, I loved when he was in Hong Kong, like smoking the cigarette. Like yeah, when he like gets to be like a sort of suave, dashing guy instead of this yeah. sort of, like befuddled kind of like beta husband. Yeah, I I really loved him in that movie. Honestly, yeah, he was really he he moved my heart in that movie. Yeah, so I, I think mean, he's gonna win, and I would probably vote for him. I mean, especially considering, like, the story he just told on, like, late night TV about how he lost his health insurance. Holy shit. Like, he, like, he, <laughs> really? like, he lost his health insurance before, like, for an entire year because, like, they stopped filming this movie because of COVID. And he was calling his agent being like, I just need one job to re-up my health insurance for the next year. And he couldn't get one. No one oh gave God. him any work. And That's then, like you know, so th- this is this is the real feel good triumphant story of, of this year in the Academy Awards, and like it's his category and no one else. Yeah. All right. Yeah, he better win. Cinematography, editing, screenplay, adaptive screenplay. Uh, we, we we can skip over those. I just want to talk a little bit about international feature and animated feature. So for international feature, we've got All Quiet on the Western Front, a movie called Argentina, nineteen eighty five, a movie called. Uh, Cl- Close from Belgium or Close, I don't know. EO from Poland and The Quiet Girl from Ireland. Um, conspicuously absent from this list is RRR, the movie that absolutely should yeah. win Best Foreign Feature that was one of, if not my favorite movie of the year. R- the RRR is it's, it's nominated for Best Original Song. They're going to perform Not To Not To at the Oscars, which is like the main reason I'm going to watch the awards this year. But um, glaring, glaring error on the part of the Academy not nominating RRR in this category. Probably I still haven't seen it. It's it's everything like that. The, the hype about it is, if the anything, hype is real. if anything, undersells just how insane and okay. like off the hook this movie is. <laughs> I gotta see it. I gotta see it. Maybe I'll watch that tonight. Also, I mean, it's it like this is like it, it, it's the promise of like movie making of like big. Okay, the way I would describe RRR. And the director of this movie has since name-checked Mel Gibson as a major influence on him. This is the movie Mel Gibson would make if he were Hindu instead of Catholic. <laughs> and, like, if that doesn't sell it for you, like... Assault. I mean, yeah, there Assault. is just insane violence. An unbelievable hatred of the British. Like, like ma- manliness, but tempered with a lot of... It, like at one scene of extreme homoerotic sadism. So this this has this has the this has the DNA of Mel's hell all over it. I cannot I cannot rave enough about RRR. Just everything about it. I was floating watching this movie. Amazing. I got to check it out. Now, as for uh, what will win, I mean, look, All Quiet on the Western Front is nominated for Best Picture. So the fact that like it's not going to win Best Picture, uh, it almost certainly going to win Best Foreign Film. I have not seen like any of these movies, although I really do want to see EO, the other major movie about a donkey this year. I've heard of Close. I one of my friends really liked Close. I think um, so. I I think that's about like two boys who are gay or something. I don't know. <laughs> I think <laughs> yeah, I don't fucking know. <laughs> All right, and then. Uh, Animated feature. I basically only want to talk about one movie here. Uh, we've got Marcel the Shell with shoes on, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, The Sea Beast, Turning Red, and Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. 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 You got, yes, Tessa. <laughs> Tessa is the expert on the correct. Would you like? Would you like the school people now on Pinocchio? The correct pronunciation and Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. My one of my friends was um, talking about Pinocchio and was like, yeah, Pinocchio. And then um, my other friend had heard me say Pinocchio and was like, actually, the proper Italian pronunciation is Pinocchio. And my other friend was like, no, it's not. <laughs> Who told you that? <laughs> <I> was like, <laughs> but um, yeah, Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio is like um, one of the craziest movies I've ever seen. I like. I watched it on Christmas Day, like, and I narrated the whole thing as I was watching it in a Twitter space, and it was, like, just for no reason. But um, it's the only Pinocchio adaptation where there's a scene where Mussolini, voiced by Tom Kenny, executes Pinocchio by shooting him in the head, (laughs) in the back of the head. (laughs) And because, of course, Guillermo del Toro has to have, like, Mussolini involved in this (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, adaptation. Um, but it's like the musical numbers are embarrassingly bad. I really didn't think it was a very good movie, but there's a lot of really funny parts and fun parts. And my, um, you know, my friends who have kids said that their kids really loved it. So I'm like, you know, who's maybe it is good. I don't know. <laughs> well, I think it's going to win because it's Guillermo del Toro. And yeah, absolutely. The Oscar Oscars love Guillermo. You know, he's just mm-hmm. such a such a pleasant man. You know, like I, I think he's a guy who I like him as a person more than his movies. Maybe not to say I yeah. don't like his movies, but come on. The Shape of Water. Ooh. Yeah. Get, yeah. get, 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 probably the most like the one of the one of the one of the worst best picture winners i think of all time like that movie was yeah it, that's it, a stinker go back to sure. the fucking black lagoon <laughs> get this shit out of here yeah squidward the movie <laughs> get out of here <laughs> that shit <laughs> guillermo del toro's squidward <laughs> uh so, someone just had, someone someone had a tweet making fun of guillermo del toro and unfortunately it's like colored uh basically every one of his movies now like because it just it was just Guillermo del Toro and it was just him saying I love my monsters (laughs) (laughs) that's all I can think about whenever I think of his movies now I I love him he's like such a lovable nerd I love him in Death Stranding he's in like Hideo Kojima's game like Mm -hmm. playing I forgot what his character's name is it's something so stupid it's like die hard man yeah it's like (laughs) Big fat man, yeah. <laughs> the whale. El, oh, I saw on Twitter today that the whale in Argentina is called El Muchacho Grande. <laughs> oh my god! What, El we, like, Grande. Wait a second. There, there's no translation of whale in Spanish. El Not, like, Muchacho what that, Grande. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so like, like I'm, I'm not. Gonna, we don't have time to get into all of like the the more minor categories. You can fill out your own ballot there. But uh, has other like in terms of like the year in movies, are there are there any other movies that are not in the Oscar conversation that like are usually the movies that are most remembered of a year or like most like in the cult because like you know. Of these of these nominees, I would hazard a guess that like probably Top Gun Maverick and Avatar are going to be the two movies that people are still watching and talking about in ten or twenty years time. But like, it's usually in, in like the, the the genre movies or the movies that Oscars tend to like overlook or like not consider nominating that tend to be the most memorable movies of a given era or like the the ones that have the most lasting appeal. So, are there any are there any other movies from this year? Which was I, I thought a good year for movies. Were there any other yeah. ones that you think uh, worth? mentioning in terms of a summation of like a year at the movies you know i'm worried that like the second we end the episode i'm gonna think of something but i can't think of anything off the top of my head right now um i know there's gotta be um the the new albert Sarah movie uh pacifiction was um really good yeah that's pretty much all i can think of <laughs> Well, I, I will just throw in for consideration uh, the fact that Phil Tippett's Mad God was not nominated for Best Animated Feature is a fucking disgrace because it is like probably one of the most breathtaking works of stop motion animation ever created, if not the best stop motion animated food movie I've ever seen. Oh shit! It's it is stop a, motion. Yeah, it is. It is a stunning, stunning achievement that like he and, and you know he is like the god of stop motion animation, and this movie took him thirty or forty years to make. It is like. It, the movie is about like it is a it is a Boschian trip to hell, and in the movie I think is itself like kind of like contained within it like a, a metaphor for the creative process process itself of like you know going through hell to wring out like the to wring out your soul and like purge it and in the process create like one single like atom of dust that like you know shimmers in in some way or that that lasts or that means something. I cannot recommend Mad God enough. It's one of the most stunning animated movies I've ever seen. Uh, we mentioned RRR getting snubbed um, in the best foreign film category for obvious reasons, just because it's too cool. It's too entertaining. It's not boring. It's an action movie. And, and, and you know, Hollywood, uh, the Oscars, like, they, they always overlook genre movies. I'll also throw in David Cronenberg's Crimes of the Future as another one of oh, my yeah. favorite movies this year. Uh, you know, you want to talk about, like, what, could have been like a sort of surprise best supporting actress nominee Kristen Stewart for playing Timlin one of the weirdest <laughs> characters of the year one of the best <laughs> named characters of the year uh, just like this twitchy mousy like uh, surgery fan 
I thought I really loved her <laughs> performance in that. Leia Sadu, also awesome. Also, Leia Sadu, naked, wonderful, th- top marks for that. Um, and then also one of my other favorite movies of the year, completely forgotten about because it is a genre movie, is Barbarian. Zach oh, Krieger's Barbarian, Barbarian was awesome. It was one of the most... It was one, the, the highest praise I can give Barbarian is that it was the scariest movie I've seen all year and the funniest movie I've seen all year. And if you want to talk about a movie that like does deal with um, uh, Me Too themes, I think Barbarian is just about the only successful movie to, to, to plumb that material for like a sort of contemporary and, and let's say au courant take on a controversial uh, cultural hot topic. Oh, yeah. It's so good. I loved Barbarian. The cut to Justin Long in the car. Yes. One of, one the, of the coolest best- things. Just like hard cuts, <laughs> yeah, hard smash, smash cut. cuts in a movie smash I've ever too. seen. <laughs> yeah, and there is no, there is no visual gag that has been like as effective or funny or perfect than the tape measure gag or the googling, oh my God, yes. ca- googling Kent like underground space. Can like does it add to the total square footage of a property after he discovers a rape and a torture rape dungeon, dungeon yeah, in his Airbnb? <laughs> <laughs> I love him him answering the phone and being like his his friend calls him he's like what up faggot <laughs> like, <that's> so funny <laughs> uh, yeah I, I think Barbarian is just a movie that's that's too good uh, for the Academy Awards it's too fun and like I said genuinely genuinely had me rolling laughing in it and then just like barely could look at the screen terrified. Like, yeah, uh, there are some scenes in Barbarian that are so frightening, so mm-hmm. fucking scary, and it's just like, I horror and comedy are such like are, are are two genres that are always overlooked, they're never given any consideration by the Academy. But I think they're two very related genres, and I think it's awesome that Zach Krieger directed this because I think he understands both in horror and comedy, it's all about timing. And yeah. like to get a laugh out of someone and to get a, a, a yelp or a, a scare out of someone is basically you're executing the same move. And he does both in that movie so masterfully. And like I said, it, it, it wears its influences like, you know, he you know, he's dealing with, you know, Carpenter, obviously. But I mean, he wears his influences lightly. And I think turns one of the best horror movies I've seen in a long time. Barbarian. Yeah. Also, um, Megan was pretty funny too. There's there's a funny part in Megan where she's running on all fours after a kid, and it's like one of the funniest things I've ever seen. <laughs> but yeah, that's a really crazy fun movie. But um, I've I've yet to see Me Three again, but uh, yeah. it's it's on my list. <laughs> me Three, um, hashtag Me Three. But um, yeah, I know there's definitely like a horror I know, movie I know or I'm something forgetting a couple. that I'm forgetting. But yeah, can I shout out to one that I think will get re-evaluated from this year and one that I hope gets re-evaluated and both be, are more because of the person who directed them being a major auteur who I think will have more career and will get like the total package re-evaluation. The Northman, uh, which I think is Robert Eggers nice. continues to make movies. People will continue to go back to that and be like, you know, that movie really fucking rocks. And then the other is 3000 years of longing, which, you know, I think oh, yeah. George Miller has I, a I few, didn't see that one. Uh, it's really magnificent, I think, and beautiful and touching. Uh, definitely made me cry in theaters unexpectedly. And, you know, I think George Miller has a few more left in him. He's going to do that Fury Road sequel or prequel, rather. And I think, you know, once he and finally retires, people will look at his whole career and give that movie another shot. Uh, but I think for me personally, the unifying thing of both of them is they uh, they take a look in the uh, alien nature and mindsets of the past, which is something that I have been dealing with a lot this year. So the, both, both of those really resonated with me. And I, I think that they will both be given another chance in, in future years. Awesome. Excellent. Yeah. I had also kind of forgotten about the Northman, but I, I very much enjoyed that movie as well. Uh, Alexander Sarsgaard, maybe I was like Alexander Sarsgaard. I hate, I fucking hated infinity pool so much. Violently, <laughs> violently hated that movie. I really so, hated Possessor. I really did, really, oh, really dude, did his, not like that movie. Oh man, I, I just look. I love, sure, I love all the nihilistic uh, sex and violence and degradation. But where's the heart? Where's the <laughs> heart? Just oh god, man, just like wh- the same thing with Possessor. When he has nothing to say, he just hits you with strobing lights, and when he has nothing to show you, he just hits you with droning noise. Just, yeah, like I like. I don't mind movies that are unpleasant, but like, the, the, but, but for no point and with zero thought 
in the it, like in it at all. Brandon Cronenberg, direct a fucking romantic comedy, okay? Like yeah. stop, <laughs> like, it, like it's, 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 this is embarrassing what you're doing, man. Like it just stop. <laughs> All right, I, w- we've gone almost two hours now. I think that that was yeah. a, a a very good, a very good like uh, summation of the year at the movies mm-hmm. with uh, with with Hessa, and like also we should we should mention that this is like I said at the beginning episode zero of the upcoming Chapo miniseries Movie Mindset starring Hessa and myself, which will be dropping uh, when Hell on Earth ends. We are aiming for roughly the end of April. But uh, stay tuned. There will be definitely more movie mindset coming. We are having uh, going to be probably a ten episode run of Hessa and I talking about the movies and the way that I conceive of this is sort of like, you know, uh, I'll, I'll be like, you know, it, uh, initiating you, the listener, into the mysteries of movie mindset through uh, a curated selection of like each episode will feature I think a double a double feature curated by Hessa and myself featuring either an actor or a director. And like as a way of talking about uh, about their work, their career, and like uh, two movies of theirs, or like you know either star or director that we think are interesting and make for a good pairing with one another. But um, you know, like uh, not much more than that. Like I said, like uh, I just I love talking about movies. Uh, I love talking about movies with Hessa. We'll we'll have some guests and we'll have a lot of fun talking about some really great movies. Yeah, it's I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be so fun. All right. Well. From 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 that um, marathon movie session on to uh, the the movie mindset mini series, I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you guys are too. Uh, but you know, be on the lookout. We'll be uh we'll be promoting that. We'll, I'm working on having a sort of premiere event here and maybe a movie screening here in New York if you're around for that. Uh, but just uh, stay posted. I'm go- we're gonna hold back now the list of the, some of the names of the movies and like uh, that we'll be expecting to talk about. But, you know, like, uh, stay tuned. We'll have, like, sort of a, a watch list for you to, like, if you can, like, sort of uh, to prepare on your own uh, if you want to watch it along with us or, uh, like, start watching before we start the show to get a head start on this, uh, you can do that. But be on the lookout. for We'll drop the official list of, like, the 10 episodes and the 20 movies that are going to be featured on uh, the first run of this miniseries. But uh, the cool thing about movies is that they're never going to go away. The good times will never end, both <laughs> yep. for the people who make movies and enjoy them. And I could very much, I could very easily imagine Movie Mindset coming back, uh, hopefully in the fall for October, to do maybe a mini run of horror movies for October. Mm-hmm. And then uh, from there, like I said, like uh, uh, there's a number of different, there's, I've got a lot of ideas for Movie Mindset. There's a lot of so, movies. Yeah, there's, just, there's there are so <laughs> many good movies to talk there's about. hundreds, hundreds. Yeah. <laughs> There are literally dozens of movies to talk about, mm-hmm. <laughs> but uh, so I, I will leave you. I will leave you with that pitch for the upcoming miniseries, Movie Mindset. I, we, I hope that we have whet your appetite, and uh, we'll we'll see you at the movies. Mm-hmm. So till next time, once again, Hessa, thank you for joining. Oh, thank you for having me, and I'm looking forward to more. All right.